All right, well, in between, in our little break there, I showed you that nice documentary, right? <laughs> and so now you know my qualifications. I'm, I'm surprised JT missed it. Uh, I'm the guy who invented evolution. <laughs> I'm also the guy who convinced the deity to use it, so, you know, I, I have some authority here. As long as you believe that video, and I, I think you, from that video, you can now say there's more evidence for my role than there is for Jesus. So, which is pretty good. So what I was going to talk about today um, is, you know, here, here I've gone to all this effort of creating this magnificent system that the deity has used to create us all, and, and the darn creationists keep screwing it up. And it's annoying. So I'm going to tell you about a few things I've, I've learned from I've learned about creationists, but it's really a few things that have pissed me off about creationists. So this is, this is my cranky talk. I hope you don't mind. Yes, the talk, the talk I gave yesterday was my, my friendly, cheery talk, and this is, this is my pissed off talk. Uh, so what I want to do is I want, I want to go through a couple of little examples of things that creationists have done that have annoyed me. And They've taught me some nice vocabulary, of course. Here's a good word to learn if you're dealing with creationists. So uh, it, it's, it's amazing how pretentious they are. When you talk to a creationist, what you discover is somebody who knows absolutely nothing at all, but is thoroughly convinced that he knows it all. Uh, it, it makes for a great deal of aggravation when you're trying to impart information to them because they're already pretty convinced that you're wrong. And this is, this is the classic example. Um, a while back I got in a radio debate with a guy named Jeffrey Simmons. And you'll notice he is Jeffrey Simmons MD. One other thing I have discovered about creationists that I'll mention briefly is that they all plaster their, cre their credentials everywhere. So if they've got an MD, it's up there. If they've got a PhD, it's right there. Uh, often their PhD is some worthless piece of paper that they got from uh, an online source or something, but it's still there. Uh, this guy's a leg legitimate MD, but being an MD is not a qualification for understanding evolution, unfortunately. Anyway, so this guy, uh, he's a, he's a uh, fellow of the Discovery Institute, which you may have heard of. It's that think tank in Seattle that uh, peddles really silly creationism. And unfortunately, the, the Discovery Institute, every once in a while, gets it in their head to send a hitman out to Minnesota to take me out. They've done this a couple of times now with people like uh, Paul Nelson and, and Je Jeffrey Simmons and a few others that have come through to give lectures to show me up. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not being arrogant here. Uh, I send them packing pretty quickly. Uh, this guy was no exception. So we had a radio debate on Christian talk radio. How many of you listen to Christian talk radio? Oh, yeah. Isn't it entertaining? Yes. As long as your brain can survive the, the high-intensity moron waves, it's very entertaining. So here I am. I'm in this debate. Uh, this guy has written a book. It's called Billions of Missing Links in which he argues that the, the standard creationist trope, there are no transitional fossils. And he says it over and over again in his debate. In particular, he announces flatly that we don't understand how whales evolved. He says there are no whale transitional fossils, which of course, you know, I, I, just, I just sit there and rattle off a long list of them. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned all these things like Pachycetus and, and Rhodocetus and Ambulocetus and all these really cool whale, whale fossils that are out there. And, and he's sitting there sort of denying them all. And then he tells me he's never heard of them before. Okay, remember the, the word of the day here, pretentious? He had never heard of these. And I called him on this and I told him that... that his ignorance of these fossils is, is no evidence for his point of view, which got the radio people very upset. Uh, they, they really got angry at me because I called their, their cherished creationist ignorant when he had just demonstrated it so thoroughly for us all. Uh, he knew none of these. Uh, when I tried to pin him down, he said, well, I read an article a couple of months ago in Scientific American. 
and it said there were no whale transitional fossils, which is bizarre. You know, Scientific Americans, a popular pu uh, publication, it's not quite scientific quality, but it usually gets the story right, so I was very surprised to hear this. Uh, I later dug up this article, and it turned out to be a very nice survey of the transitional whale fossils that have been discovered in the last 20 years. So I don't know what he was doing when he read this book. Uh, he also made these claims, like he said, okay, well, you've mentioned these fossils, uh, but they don't, they don't demonstrate any transitional features. And he specifically said, you know, there's this thing called the blowhole, and in these animals, it's all up there at the tip of the nose like it is in, in most tetrapods, and you look at a whale, and it's way up here. It's just, the fossils don't show this, but this is exactly what the fossils show. Uh, that's what this little diagram down here is. That's Pachycetus rhodocetus in a modern baleen whale, and there's a phenomenon that's even got a name. It's called nasal drift. It's thoroughly documented. It's measured. They, know, they, they can tell you the rate in millimeters per million years that that nasal passage has migrated up and over to the top of the head. He didn't know about this, which is weird. We mentioned a few other things. I mean, like uh, the transitional uh, tetrapod series is really beautifully preserved. Uh, some of you may have heard of Tiktaalik, that beautiful specimen discovered by Neil Shubin up in Ellesmere Island, uh, which is a beautiful intermediate between fish-like forms and terrestrial living tetrapods. It's, it's a gorgeous fossil, it's beautiful, he's never heard of it. So this is what I mean when I say pretentious. Uh, this is a guy who's never heard of the most famous fossil series in the world. He doesn't know any of the names of these transitional species. He doesn't understand the basic concepts. He's lying about the fossils when he says they do, they do not demonstrate certain characteristics. And I will remind you, this is a guy who has written a book called Billions of Missing Links. So this is what we're dealing with. You get out there and argue with creationists and you discover they know absolutely nothing, but they are happy to write long books that are putting up a pretense of being scholarly and selling them to a gullible pub public. Okay, let me talk about another example. And here's, an, here's another good word to know. Uh, <laughs> This one I run into all the time when I'm talking with creationists. Uh, it, it's, it's the word that's right at the top of my head every time I'm dealing with one of these people. Uh, you'll notice this one does, does ask you to see the note, it's stupid. Uh, if you go there, this is what you find. <laughs> uh, Ray Com it, it, this, is kind of, this is kind of unfair of me because Ray Comfort is probably the very bottom of the creationist barrel. He's the worst of the bunch. And I've listened to Kent Hovind talk, okay? So when I say Ray Comfort is really, really stupid, I'm saying something. Well, I want to give one example of Ray Comfort's logic. And it's not the banana story. Everybody knows the banana story, right? Uh, if you don't, ask me afterwards. Uh, Ray Comfort has been doing this thing for about a year. He's got a little blog, and he, he throws these things out, and he writes books, and he goes on uh, right-wing shows and, and Christian shows, and he makes these same arguments. And there's one that has bugged me. This, first, this one first came up about a year ago. Uh, here's his foolproof argument against evolution. Okay, he says, Darwin theorized that mankind, both male and female, evolved alongside each other over millions of years both reproducing after their own kind before the ability to have sex evolved. They did this through asexuality. Each of them split in half. <laughs> now, th think about this, okay? This is Ray Comfort's argument. Uh, he is doing two things here. He is saying this really silly claim that humans reproduced by asexual fission for millions of years, and he's saying that Darwin said this. I guarantee you, I know Darwin's works inside and out, I've read them all, and nowhere does he say that human beings reproduce by splitting in half. <laughs> okay. I actually took some time out and I wrote a post explaining to him that this is not true. Darwin never claimed this. Humans evolved from other apes, 
these other apes were sexually reproducing, we were sexually reproducing. Sexual reproduction was not a novel innovation in the appearance of the human species, okay? It's been there all along. In fact, if, if you want to trace the evolution of, of this kind of sexual reproduction that we have, you have to go all the way back to single-celled organisms before you find a, a complicating instance where you do have asexual reproduction and you do have reproduction by fission. Well, there, there probably are a few primitive metazoans, but they're all extinct now, so we don't know too much about them. Okay, so this, I explained them carefully. This is, this is totally false. And I know that Ray Comfort noticed this because he commented on his blog about it. And he said he'd think about it. <laughs> so he thinks about it. And a little later, he comes up with a brand new blog post. And this is what he says, okay. Uh, let's look at elephants. Elephants have male and female populations. At what time in evolutionary history did the female evolve alongside the male? And why did she evolve? And he's got this long story about how the first elephant, who was of course male, because in his worldview, everything that's first is male. So the first male elephant evolves, and it's stumped because it can't find a female elephant to mate with. <laughs> this is Ray Comfort's logic. I know, it's a, it's a strange world I have led you into. So once again, I, I write a, a long post where I ex carefully explain to them all these details about the evolution of whales, or I mean ele of elephants. So this, these are some little diagrams I dug up. They're very nice diagrams. And again, they show the same thing I talked about before, that these elephants evolved from earlier elephants who were also sexually reproducing, that there was no novel innovation required for these new species to uh, acquire sex. And also, I carefully explained that evolution is about changing populations. That what happened is you had a population of elephants that gradually evolved, and at no time were there single individuals. It was always dealing with populations. So there was always somebody to mate with. If there wasn't, you wouldn't see elephants nowadays. Okay. I explained this to him. I thought I, I thought I'd nailed it down just, just fine. Uh, and then he goes on Pat Robertson's show, and they have a little interview, and he explains his killer argument against evolution, which is this one. <laughs> a dog evolves. It's the first dog. He's got to find a female because without the female, he's, got, he's a dead dog. He's not going to have anything to reproduce with. So we've gone from humans to elephants to dogs. Every time he's not grasping the concept, he's focusing on, well, this species had to evolve, have evolved this way. Uh, and, and this was, this, if, if you look on YouTube and you can find this, this little video recording of this interview, and it's amazing, because not only is it Ray Comfort, but it's Pat Robertson. <laughs> Together. <laughs> Stupidity multiplies. It's, they're sitting, and he, and you know, Ray, uh, Pat Robertson is sitting there with his, his, his goofy little smile, nodding his head, and saying, "Wow, you've really done it. You've got, you've got the evolution on the run." Uh, and, and this is what Ray Comfort says: yeah, "Evolution is crazy. People don't think very deeply." <laughs> oh man! You know, the irony—it's, it's, it, it will kill you in this business. Well, that's not enough. Uh, I, again, I explained to him, it's not dogs. This is generalizable to all animal species. Uh, so what does he do? He writes another post, and this is what he says. Uh, he, he matches me and generalizes it and says that everything is that way, that any species that will come into existence without a mature female present, again, species evolved by a male appearing first and then hanging around waiting for a willing, nubile, attractive female to pop into existence, and then mating continues. Uh, this, this is how he, and, and, you know, he says, why did hundreds of thousands of animals, fish, reptiles, and birds evolve a female partner that coincidentally matured at just the right time with each species? It's clear that in order to win this argument, I have got to do these same arguments for 100,000 species or so. I, and I'm afraid to mention to him that plants reproduce sexually, too. <laughs> okay. Well, Ray Comfort is, is the gift that never stops giving. Uh, here's another word for you. 
Uh, not, not only is he obtuse, but you may have heard this in the news lately. You may have seen this on the, this campus the last couple of days. Uh, he's, he's really hit rock bottom in the sleazy category here. Uh, what uh, he has done lately is he has been distributing his very own personal, customized copy of Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. The hubris there is kind of amazing. Basically what he's noticed is, well, this book is 150 years old and it wasn't produced by Walt Disney, therefore <laughs> it's wide open and you can do whatever you want with it. And so we got the text and this is easy to do. Any of you can get the text too. Just you know, go to Project Gutenberg, just search on Google. Uh, the entire volume of The Origin of Species is available on the web in plain text and PDF, all these different formats. You can get each of the seven editions separately. It's amazing what you can get off the web there, and it's all there. So what he did is he, he took this, which is fine. Like I said, we can all do this too. We can all get our own private copy, electronic copy of The Origin easily. Uh, and then he wrote a 50-page introduction to it that is a catalog of inane creationist lies with uh, roughly nine pages that's decent. There's a, a nine-page biography of Charles Darwin that's not bad. It's actually pretty good. Um, the, the only sad thing about it is that if you look for this particular biography, you discover that he plagiarized it. He stole it off the web from a legitimate, reasonable college professor who'd written a short essay on Charles Darwin and posted on his website. And there it is, it's right, it's the only decent part of his entire introduction, the rest of it is complete garbage. And yeah, he's been distributing these, I've seen a few of you here who've got these. Uh, yeah, aren't, aren't, isn't it amazing? How much money does this guy have? He's, he's reportedly published, had about 100,000 copies of this published, he's been distributing them all across the country. So, uh, stupidity pays. That's, that's all I've learned from this particular incident. Okay, let me talk about another one. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of beer to cleanse our palate after Ray Comfort, that's for sure. Uh, here's another good word. Uh, incompetent. And it's amazing how incompetent creationists are, even the ones who are considered uh, real scholars in the creationist community. Uh, this definition I particularly love because of that last little definition. A sphincter unable to perform its function. <laughs> Seriously, whenever I see a creationist now, I, I see sphincter. Malfunctioning sphincter. There it is. Well, let me talk about one among many incidents that, that uh, uh, emphasize this lack of competence on their part. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was in Chicago at a big conference of, of Darwin scholars and evolutionary biologists, and this was an amazing conference. These were the biggest names in the field. They were all getting up there, showing off their best work, and telling us all these wonderful stories, all this great science that's being done in evolutionary biology right now. Uh, one of these stories, I, I could sit up here for a couple hours talking about all the stuff at this one meeting, but then Rebe Rebecca would beat me up, and it wouldn't be fun. One of the best stories is this one. It's from a guy named David Kingsley at Stanford University, and he's looking at the evolution of sticklebacks. Turns out sticklebacks are a wonderful model system for this because uh, what you have is a marine population. Uh, they live out in the ocean in salt water. Uh, they're heavily armored, and as the name might imply, they're covered with spikes. They got these little spikes in the, along their back, and in particular, they have these pelvic fins that have been strongly calcified and they're very sharp and pointy and these are very useful properties for a small fish to have because it makes them unappetizing. It's like bite, biting into a, into a little pile of needles if you try and eat a stickleback. So they've developed this armor, these spikes, all over their body. The sticklebacks though come into freshwater to breed and in particular they may go up long distances and they, they may actually get stranded in some cases high upstream in lakes and ponds and so forth. And what will happen then is that they'll be isolated from the parent population and they will start to diverge. They will start to do this thing called evolution. 
right there in these little isolated ponds. It's a beautiful place to study speciation. Um, so David Kingsley has been doing this, this amazing work where he's sampling multiple populations, subpopulations of sticklebacks all over the place, and he's working out exactly what happens to them when they evolve. Most of these ponds, they're, they're fairly young. They're under 10,000 years. So he's looking at a little slice, 10,000 years of evolution. And he can bring all these wonderful techniques to bear on them. Uh, what he can do is he can take populations uh, from the marine population, for instance, the freshwater population, and if you bring them together naturally, they, they, they don't like each other. They look very different from one another, and they don't interbreed, but they've only been separated for a few thousand years, so you can artificially inseminate and do hybrids. You can do genetic crosses with these. So you can, for instance, take these heavily armored marine versions of the stickleback, and the one at the bottom is a freshwater fish, which has lost most of its armor, and also in particular, it's lost that spine. They do this because uh, when you go from deep water out in the ocean to the shallow waters, your predators change. And these sticklebacks are mostly preyed upon by these evil things called dragonfly larvae, which like to reach up and hook fat passing fish, tow them, pull them down and eat them. And to these animals, those pelvic spines are just these handy handles. Uh, to, to the dragonfly, what this is, is fish on a stick. And they can just grab it. Mmm, chew on it. So they lose these things. Now you can ask, what's going on here? How are they doing this? And he's mapped out the genes that are involved. For instance, one, one of the primary genes involved is something called PIDX1, which is a gene that's expressed all over the place. It's expressed in your pituitary gland. It's expressed in some of your internal organs. Yeah, we have this gene too. And it's also expressed in the hind limbs. And it seems to be the gene that's switching on this armored stuff. So what he's done is he's worked out in detail which gene it is. He's gone in such detail that he knows precisely which regulatory region of the gene is changed between these species. He's mapped it all out. This, this is the kind of stuff that, that blows the mind of evolutionary biologists because what it means is that not only can we identify species and follow their evolutionary changes, we can follow them in such detail that we know precisely what mutations occurred and work them out. Okay, so trust me, it's beautiful stuff. Read, you know, if you look in Nature and Science, you'll find David Kingsley and his work all over the place. It, it's just amazing. Okay, so we're at this meeting. He's giving this presentation. It's gorgeous. We're all impressed. Uh, it turns out, we should have some ominous music here, there were creationists in attendance. Okay. Uh, in particular, there's this fellow named Paul Nelson, a fellow of the Discovery Institute. Uh, who uh, likes to think that he's sophisticated and s thinks scientifically and he goes to science conferences all the time and annoys us with really stupid questions and, and stupid propositions. Uh, anyway, he's there and afterwards we get together at a little reception and I see Nelson there. And, uh, yeah, it's terrible to say, you know, I, I, when I see creationists, I, I don't run up and kick them in the balls. I, I don't. I will have a polite conversation with them. And so that's what happened. We had a polite conversation. And Nelson explained to me uh, that, hey, that was really cool work that Kingsley was doing. But you know, ultimately, it's kind of trivial. It doesn't mean much. It's just things getting broken. That what's always happening is he's describing these fish, and they're losing pieces. And you can see what the, the, the wheel's turning in his head. You know, he's thinking, oh, the fall. I just knew it. He's thinking the biblical fall. This is what we expect. Everything falls apart. And he actually writes about this. He puts this on the web later. And here he says, you know, the evolutionary changes, they're all losses. Uh, they lose pelvic structures. They do this all over the place. And he says, a macroevolution can't be this. And then he throws out, a, uh, uh, drops a name here, Mike Behe, and, and he have talked about this quite a bit. Uh, he says, it was all breaking things and losing things. <laughs> Talk about missing the point. This is a case where they have worked out in detail the genetic changes that have caused morphological changes in a lineage. They understand this stuff. And, you know, the cool thing we're discovering is that there are all these regulatory switches that are turning morphology off and on. And basically what he's saying is, oh yeah, they've discovered a switch. It's in the off position. It doesn't do anything. If you've got a switch, though, you know, if, and if it's a switch, you can flip it on. 
you can flip it off. That's the power of it. You can, do, you can go both ways. Uh, these changes, you can also have sticklebacks that evolve the other way. So here's an example of this. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Lake Washington near Seattle, uh, where they've observed an interesting phenomenon. There's a population of sticklebacks in this lake. And the sticklebacks, for a long time, uh, were pretty heavily armored. Why? Because they didn't have to worry too much about dragonflies, because this was an urban lake. It was disgusting. This was, this was actually when I was living in Seattle. Uh, you, you didn't really want to go swimming in Lake Washington. It was pretty turbid and muddy and unpleasant looking. Uh, so you had sticklebacks in there. They didn't have to worry about the dragonflies, because the dragonflies couldn't see them. The lake was that murky. And what happened is they got smart, and they cleaned up the lake. They reduce the turbidity in the lake. They remove the pollution. Uh, right now, Lake Washington is a beautiful place to visit. And uh, what happened in that case is now the, the fish have changed, and they have acquired armor again. Why? Because now uh, the fish in the lake can see them from a long distance and come charging up and try and eat them. So what's happened now is you've got sticklebacks that have turned on armor. This is not a loss, is it? I kind of suspect that in the minds of the Discovery Institute people, they're, they're somehow going to distort it into that. But yeah, this is a case where they have built armor and built pel pelvic spines. Here's another case. Uh, and again, I'm going to talk about fish because I love fish. Um, if you read Sean Carroll's book, The Making of the Fittest, he talks about this in great detail. And it's another beautiful story in fish. And what they're doing is they're looking at ice fish. These are these amazing Antarctic fish uh, that are almost perfectly transparent. And one of the ways they've achieved this transparency is they no longer have red blood cells. They've gotten rid of them. Uh, they live in water that is so cold, you know, the colder the water, the higher the oxygen carrying capacity, uh, they can get by with just plasma instead of plasma plus red blood cells. Uh, of course, the other catch is that this is in salt water. And as you all know, salt water freezes at a lower temperature than fresh water. Uh, the insides of a fish are less salty than the ocean around them. And they have another problem, and that is that at those temperatures, if they didn't do something, uh, all these little ice fish would be swimming around and they'd freeze solid and go clunk, drop to the floor, floor of the ocean dead. So they've evolved an antifreeze. Here's another case where you could look at it superficially and say, well, oh, it's just losing things. They've lost their red blood cells, <laughs> right? And yes, the creationists have said this, but at the same time, they've acquired something. They've acquired an antifreeze. Where did the antifreeze come from? The other thing in this diagram that I put up here is we also know when these fish evolved, and we know what environmental circumstances caused them to evolve. And what it is is they, they're all down around Antarctica. And, and around about 35 million years ago, Antarctica, you know, if you, look at the, if you look at the globe and you look at Antarctica right there at the bottom, uh, and you know how South America reaches down with Tierra del Fuego and all that sort of stuff. Uh, 35 million years ago, they were connected. So there was a land bridge right there, which meant that ocean currents didn't go around the Antarctic. They went around it, and then they hit South America, and then they went up to the equator, and the waters warmed up and came back down. And so the Antarctic was fairly temperate 35 to 50 million years ago. Then this thing uh, called uh, Plate tectonics happen, they separated, all of a sudden the currents could just do this, go circling around and around, never taking a vacation in the equator, and getting colder and colder and colder. And we've got this period of this rapid cooling phase, it's illustrated here, uh, 25 to 15 million years ago, where the temperature just slowly dropped. They call it a rapid cooling phase because they're, they're, they're thinking geologically, okay, rapid to them is, oh wow, five million years to drop 10 degrees centigrade. OK, but anyway, it's getting colder and colder. So there was this gradual period where they had to adapt to extremely frigid conditions. Uh, they could start off without an antifreeze. And as it got colder, the, uh, an antifreeze became more and more advantageous. Well, you might ask, where did the antifreeze come from? And here it is. Isn't this perfectly clear to everyone? Uh, th th this is an amazing diagram. Um, you know, I, I read Making of the Fittest, it described this now, so I had to go back to the original papers, and I went back to the original papers where they isolated the antifreeze gene to figure out what it was. And unfortunately, scientists tend to not to be very good graphic designers, which is why this is some kind of ugly pink with blue and yellow and orange and green all over the place. 
Uh, so it's a really ugly diagram, but it's extremely informative. Uh, what they're showing up at the top, up there at the very top, that's the antifreeze protein. That's the gene for the antifreeze protein. And what it is, is, is if you're used to thinking about molecular biology, it's a diagram of the gene structure where off to the left there, there's that SP and 100 base pair, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's describing a regulatory region. It's a little strip in front of the gene itself. So that's where these, all, all these interactions go on to turn it off and on. The blue part is the gene itself. And it turns out the antifreeze is really simple. It's just uh, it's a short peptide with three amino, acid, amino acids repeated over and over again. Threonine, alanine, alanine. That's all it is. Threonine, alanine, alanine. And that's enough to prevent nucleation of ice crystals. If you get that in your blood, you don't freeze. OK. So there's the gene. They find it. Uh, and then what they say was, well, of course, you don't stop there. We've got the enterprise gene. you got to ask, where did this thing come from? And so they sort of scout around the rest of the fish genome. They ask, are there any other parts of the genome that resemble the antifreeze protein. And yeah, they find it. It's that second one right there, the one that says B. Uh, they find that there's another gene. It's a, called a trypsinogen-like protease gene. And what it is is an enzyme. It's a digestive enzyme produced by the pancreas. The pancreas produces this enzyme, secretes it into the small intestine. And what it does there is, is it's, it's a protease. It breaks down protein, so it helps digest the proteins that the fish eat. It has nothing to do with antifreeze. But look at the sequence. That initial segment is almost identical, so it's got a very similar regulatory region in front of it. And then the first three uh, amino acids coded for by this particular protein are threonine, alanine, alanine. And then the rest of that orange stuff, that's the business side of the enzyme. So they immediately could see, well, here's where the amino acid or the uh, antifreeze came from. It's a copy of this particular enzyme that got truncated. So just chopped off that irrelevant enzyme part. Just has that initial segment. Again, these are processes that happen all the time in cells, so we know about these. Uh, it makes this little antifreeze right there, and that's all it is. And then over the course of time, it got duplicated and duplicated, so you have many copies of the threonine, alanine, alanine, and there it is. It's, it's a very convincing story. And to make it even more convincing, uh, that wasn't the whole story. Uh, what they have in the fish genome is a copy of the anaphorase gene. They have a copy of the trypsinogen-like protease gene. And they also have a, another copy, which is an intermediate. It's a copy of the gene that was taken made by a gene duplication event during the evolution of the anaphorase. And that's illustrated in C and D. And what this is, is it's a gene that's got the anaphorase stuff duplicated in it. And it's also got a big chunk of the trypsinogen protein stuck in there as well. So it's like a fossil of the gene during its evolution, captured right there in the genome. So there's the whole story. Here's how these fish evolved this new gene product over the course of this period of cooling. Oh, and there's other parts of the story fit together. It turns out that the antifreeze has some peculiarities, which are what you'd expect from a gene that evolved from a uh, pancreatic enzyme, uh, it turns out that the way the fish makes the antifreeze is it makes it in the pancreas, secretes it into the small intestine, and then the small intestine absorbs it and passes it into the circulatory system where it does its work as an antifreeze. So it's a really beautiful story, very clear, step by step, everything has been found. Which leads into this next word. Uh, this is something else creationists are is they're very dismissive. You can imagine what the creationists think of the ice fish story. It's just a little protein. <laughs> Big deal. They do this over and over again. I got to give you another story. Uh, this, this is another great story. Uh, this is uh, the work of a guy named Joe Thornton at the University of Oregon, who's been looking at the evolution of receptors, hormone rece receptors that we have a big battery of all kinds of different hormone receptors in our bodies, right? We all know this. Males have got one set of receptors. Females have another set of receptors. It's responsible for a lot of beautiful differences between us. These things had to evolve. Uh, Thornton is looking at a particular class of, of uh, uh, corticoid receptors. One you may have heard of, cortisol. 
Uh, if you have inflammation, you get things like cortisone and so forth. It mimics this particular, this particular hormone. It, it regulates the stress response. So you use this to reduce inf inflammation if you're injured, for instance. So we've got this one. Uh, we've also got another one. It's, it's a mineralocorticoid called aldosterone. Aldosterone is a hormone that you don't hear much about because what it does is it regulates uh, salt balance in your body. There are diseases that throw it off. You may have heard of Addison's disease. JF, John F. Kennedy had this. Addison's, it, it's a defect in this particular uh, structure that, that, that causes overproduction or underproduction of these particular hormones, and it throws your salt balance way off, and you get all kinds of unfortunate symptoms. Well, when you look at these two hormones, they're diagrammed right up there. They look awfully similar. You might guess, hey, maybe there's some evolutionary relationship between these. When you look further, you find that there are these proteins that have to be on the surface of cells that bind those particular hormones. These are called hormone receptors. And Thornton is looking at the evolution of glucocorticoid receptors, these GRs that bind to cortisol, and mineralocorticoid receptors, the MRs, that bind to aldosterone. And he knows a bunch of things about this stuff. He knows the specificity of their binding. He knows which, pro which hormones bind to which protein. He knows they're homologous to each other. The proteins look very similar when you look at their sequence. And he's just asking these basic questions. Which one evolved first? And I won't go into all the details. It gets pretty hairy and technical. But I'll summarize what he, what he does is he makes hypotheses. He looks at different forms of these receptors and he asks, OK, what's the difference? What, what, what nucleotides, what amino acids have changed between them? And then he postulates what an ancestor would have looked like. So he says, well, they're, they're two amino acids different. Let's ask what happens if we make them one amino acid different. And he synthesizes whole new receptor proteins that have their postulated ancestral form. Basically, it's a kind of molecular archaeology where he is reconstructing the ancient forms of proteins. And then he's inserting them back into animals and asking, what do they do? Are they specific? Which, which hormone do they bind to? which one evolved first, what changes had to have occurred. And he's worked this out in great detail. And again, like I said, I'm not going to go into this and bore you any more than I already have. But he's worked out step by step this stuff. He, it's amazing work because he can tell you which amino acid had to have changed first. He knows the order that they changed. You know which two amino acids had to have changed. He knows which ones are responsible for the specificity of binding to aldosterone versus cortisone. He can tell you the entire evolutionary history of these two proteins. This is exactly what the intelligent design people have been demanding of us. They want step-by-step -step molecular descriptions of the evolution of significant structures in our evolutionary history. And Joe Thornton has provided it. He seriously has. Uh, now, you might imagine what the creationists would say at this. You know, here's something they've been demanding for years. Joe Thornton has conveniently provided it for them. You would expect them to say, wow, that is amazing. You have done it. OK, you have demonstrated unambiguously the evolution of a molecular machine, a significant one in our history, too. Uh, this is what they actually said. <laughs> they, they were given this work, shown it, had it carefully explained to them in little words because we don't expect them to understand anything too complicated. Every detail is explained to them. And Mike Behe says it's piddling. Uh, the Stephen Meyer, who is another guy at the Discovery Institute, uh, declares that it's trivial. How can we win? OK. Uh, you see, you can do things like you can find evidence of these big macroevolutionary changes, things like what's going on in sticklebacks, the stuff that they were describing in ice fish with these major changes in proteins, these new proteins evolving. And what do they say? It's still just fish. It's only breaking things. They trivialize it. When you work out the details step by step, what do they say? It's piddling. Which leaves us in an interesting dilemma here. Where, where do we find the balance here? You know, if we get the big picture, uh, it's not detailed enough. If we get the details, it's trivial. So this is what creations are. They're, they're simply science deniers. They're extremely annoying this way. <sighs> OK. Uh, anyway, you know, 
if you want to if you want to hear more about these, you can uh, sign up at University of Minnesota Morris and take my courses, and I go over these <laughs> in great detail. And uh, our tuition is fairly low; it's only a few thousand dollars a year. what is it, five thousand bucks a year? See, you can afford this. Come take my classes; it's it's a it's a good thing to do. Uh, let me just do one last one, uh, a quick one, because Rebecca wants to get up here. Yes. Okay. Another good word to know. Uh, the, the, uh, the complaints that Gracious makes are, are just silly and pointless. They're trivial. In the true sense of the word, not in the Michael Behe, Stephen Meyer sense of the word. Uh, they, they really are saying stupid things. And I just want to mention one little story here because it involves puppy dogs. And I've heard that it's always good to end a lecture on cute, happy puppy dogs. <laughs> Uh, we know a lot about the evolution of dogs. We have all kinds of information on these. We have sequenced the genome of dogs. Okay, we know their differences. We know the differences between dogs and wolves, for instance. We've characterized the differences. We can put together nice molecular cladograms that tell us about the divergence time. We know when they evolve. Furthermore, we've got archaeological evidence. It turns out people love puppy dogs. We have, from China, from 15,000 years ago, evidence of these dogs. These village dogs, that their, their remains are found in these archaeological sites. And so from 15,000 years ago, we have them in China. Uh, this other one, yes, uh, 12,000 years ago in the Middle East, we have real evidence of, of the true love between dogs and human beings that we have burials. People so loved their puppy dogs that when they died, they wanted to be buried with them. They didn't love them quite enough to let them live after they died. <laughs> but we're getting there. So we have these burials. Of, you know, we find them. They're 12,000 years old. They're clearly dated. We know the history. People, dogs, dogs domesticated. And, and the one point I want to make about this is this is a case where we have clear evidence that we were taming and loving puppy dogs 9,000 years before the creation of the world. <laughs> so, you can't get much more ridiculous than that, than what, what the creationists are claiming. Okay, I'm a cat lover, so I apologize. Do you have cats nailed down that well? Um, not quite as well because it turns out people don't want to be buried with their cats very often. The, weren't the Except Egyptians? the Egyptians. Yeah. But the Egyptians are much more recent than any of this stuff. Um. So yeah, we've got, we've got good records from the Egyptians. Uh, we actually think that cats evolved in North Africa and those early Egyptians were probably the first people dom domesticating them. So they're, they're, they're quite nouveau compared to dogs. Okay, well... Yeah. Cats rule, dogs drool. Yes, I, I, have, I have two cats and they own me, so I, I know what you mean. One, one, you were talking about how they dismiss the, as piddling the finding yes. the evolutionary path with the, the genetic, the, the protein level, but um, one I often hear is, how, where does a liver come from? You, you don't just get a whole liver. And I know, there, I know we know something that liver cells evolved from fat cells, and then you can, you can explain where uh -huh. the liver comes from. Do you, I would actually be interested to know, has anyone worked this out as thoroughly or nearly as thoroughly? In, in Not as thoroughly because the liver evolved uh, roughly, se I'm, I'm guessing 700, 750 million years ago. Uh, that what we have is liver tissue in insects and in people. So it tells you right away that the divergence was long, long ago. Yeah. Um, we know that in, in many primitive organisms, the liver is a fairly simple structure, a small structure with, with a few cells. So it's a, it's a specialized population of cells. That's, that's how it started. We yeah. can't say much more than that. Yeah, I, I think that's one I hear a lot from creationists, like where does the liver come from? Yeah, embryologically. Embryologic if, if you guys could, could nail that one down, because that would really shame them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I will tell my developmental biologist friends that Richard Carrier Please says. Please do. This. Yeah, I would. I would love um, to see that story written out. Yeah, uh, we we do know that we know we know the broad picture of it. That um, embryologically, the way you develop is you start by forming this gut tube, which is just a simple tube running from mouth to anus. And what happens is you get little diverticula, you get little specializations of patches of that tube. Uh, and in, in some cases, those patches expand. And the liver, for instance, is just an outbud, an outgrowth of the gut tube. And so that, that's how we expect it to evolve. It's just a, it's a little chunk of the gut that's gut specialized. Uh, you also see this for other structures like uh, pancreas, uh, lungs. All these tissues are, are simply outgrowths of this, this initial tube. So take a tube and, and make branches off of it. That's how you make these organs. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. With no trucks, yes. Yeah, um, I was going to ask, so does this uh, comfort guy, does he believe that only same-gender parents pass along their genetic information to their offspring? And if so, is this a common belief among people who don't believe in evolution? Uh, I think you're giving Comfort far too much credit for what he knows. <laughs> I, I just didn't understand the argument apart from that. Yeah, every, every conversation, you know, I've had, I haven't met him face to face, but every conversation I've had a, with him over email or over the internet, uh, his level of igno ignorance is appalling. I mean, this, this is a guy, I mean, even if, you gotta figure, a guy who postulated humans evolved by, or reproduced by fission, you know he doesn't know much biology. Okay. So, yeah, he, he doesn't know anything about genetics, transmission of traits. He doesn't worry about it. Uh, God said it. That's the way it is. Okay. I just had uh, one thing. Uh, do you think that the uh, misinformation regarding uh, uh, the high numbers of people say that they don't believe in, in evolution is actually more close to the character of people who don't know basic facts about American history than a large number of people who are actually scientifically dedicated to the idea that it, that it uh, is fundamentally flawed? So I'm, not, so I'm not sure what the question is. Is it, is it, are you asking whether the majority of people are simply... In other uh, words, when these polls come out that uh, routinely show that people say, claim not to believe in evolution, do you think that it's mostly just a matter of public ignorance that relates to a lot of... Oh, rather fields? than this kind of active, malicious thing that, then, that yeah. great comfort... Yeah, that the majority of people don't know much about evolution because they don't care much about evolution. And most of their assessments of evolution are made entirely on aesthetic grounds. You've all heard the argument, I didn't come from no monkey, right? That's, that's the level of reasoning that they have. That's why they reject it. Do you have any stories or impressions from the Creation Museum? <laughs> stories or impressions? I, I, I'll show you my t-shirt. Yes. Oh. Okay. I'm flashing. I've always wanted to do this. Uh, yeah, the, the Creation Museum is, is a... It surprised me at, at how, bad, how bad it was. That uh, it makes a series of fallacious arguments. Uh, it's more akin to a Disney ride than it is to a museum and that you have to go through this one little path and it leads you through these arguments. Um, one thing that totally surprised me uh, is, is I've talked to many creationists and, and you talk to your average creationist and they're pretty fuzzy on this evolution thing and they're willing to say things like, well, the book of Genesis is metaphorical. You know, that they say, oh, it was a day age, a day age theory that each day that God was working could have been thousands or millions of years and willing to say this sort of thing. Um, when you get into the Creation Museum, you discover this, this um, incredibly obstinate view that you have to take the Bible absolutely word for word, literally. This is not even, this is not good theology, but it's not even good creationism. Creationism for the last century has, has avoided that kind of thing. Um, they say that the earth was specifically created in 4004 BC you know, James Usher's old arguments. Uh, they say the flood occurred in 2348 BC, precisely, uh, which leads to these, these um, you know, th this is the funniest part to me, is they, they have a bunch of, of dinosaur fossils there, because dinosaurs are cool and impressive, and they've got dinosaurs from the Triassic, 
they've got dinosaurs from the Jurassic and they've got dinosaurs from the Cretaceous, you know, the three big areas of the Mesozoic. And you go through these and they've got these little placards on them that are all scientific. They give the Latin name and they say, oh, this is from the Triassic. And they'll say the Triassic, 2348 BC. The next dinosaur is from the Jurassic, 2348 BC. Cretaceous, 2348 BC. I'm thinking that in their mind, uh, the Triassic was like May. <laughs> Jurassic about April, you know, the, the, this, this is how they're thinking. Uh, it, it, it's this, it, it, it's so literal, it hurts. I'm, I'm so used to other creationists who, while really ridiculous, are at least willing to bend a little bit and say, well, okay, we can, we can have, allow a little mo metaphor here, we can explain some phenomena with science, not at the Creation Museum. It is flat out, straight, biblical literalism as interpreted by James Usher and as interpreted by the Seventh-day Adventists which is another surprising connection, which I won't get into right now. I was homeschooled in a theist environment and only learned about evolution from the theist point of view in textbooks such as Understanding and Exploring God's World. Um, obviously, as an atheist now, I no longer adopt that mindset. Um, if I'm trying to expand my knowledge of evolution in a correct way and uh -huh. basically unlearn all of the incorrect information, what is the best starting point for that? Oh, you are really in luck. I mean, there has been a boom in popular books on evolution lately. Um, there, there's a couple I recommend. Uh, Look for Sean Carroll's Making of the Fittest. He's the one that gave that ice fish story. And what's marvelous about Sean Carroll is he doesn't try to give you the whole picture all at once. What he does is here, he gives you examples. He tells you, here's an example of these ice fish, and here's how we know they evolved. Here's all the details of their evolution. And you can sort of grasp this, this concept in, you know, in a small area very well. Uh, other books to look for is, are, are um, Neil Shubin's Your Inner Fish. Why do you laugh? Don't you realize we're all fish? Yes, cladistically we are all fish. And uh, he's, he's, he, he is taking a very specific approach. He, I talked to him about this. Uh, he teaches human physiology and anatomy and he saw this as a way to relate this, this whole concept of evolution to what, for instance, a bright pre-med student would be interested in knowing. So he's explaining how evolution explains all these annoying features of the human body like bad backs and things like that. And you can get it all straight from the evolutionary history. Uh, another one is uh, Jerry Coyne's Why Evolution is True, uh, another book that it takes, a, it takes a, a wider approach where it goes through these different lines of evidence like uh, biogeography, morphology, etc., and gives all the evidence explains that supports the evolutionary theory in that little category. It's very handy that way. And, and of course, I got to mention Richard Dawkins' new book, uh, The Greatest Show on Earth which is beautifully written and is written specifically at a very basic level so anyone here can read it, unless you're a creationist, in which case you really need some remedial work. Uh, that will be Richard Dawkins' next book. He's writing a children's book. So we hope, we hope that creationists maybe can start there and work their way up. Over here, there's... Thanks. You say most of the internal organs probably have come from this tube, right? No. Well, there's a set of them that come from that tube. Uh, there are organs that have different developmental origins. The kidneys and the heart in particular come to mind, but yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, well, Richard, if, if, they, if they nailed the, 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 the whole sequence down to, of the liver back to this tube, I'm certain that the creationists would just call it tripe. <laughs> Don't give them any assistance, please. They're, they're, yeah. Over. One more? There's people all over here. Sorry, Rebecca, you don't get to talk tonight because. <laughs> um, I have a lot of uh, friends and coworkers who say that they believe in um, evolution, the evolution process, but they say that they don't believe in how it all started. They think that a god started it all and then let everything else flow and 
I feel like it's my duty to try to tell them like, eh, no. But um, yeah. I, they kind of want the one-line answer to convince them, and I was. And just saying if, they're wrong doesn't work. Apparently not. <laughs> but uh, I was wondering if you had any advice as to what I could say to oh. try to help them, other than just saying, "Well, here are there, these books. There, Please read them." Yeah, there's there's no one-word answer. Um, sorry to say, um, there, there's this whole field of, of research in abiogenesis. It's basically looking at chemical evolution. And people have won Nobel Prizes for this. For instance, Tom Cech won his, for his work on RNA worlds and so forth. Uh, so there's a huge body of evidence out there. And, oh man, summarizing it once, no, I can't do it. Uh, a book, I'll, I'll recommend a couple books, though. Uh, it's always easier to just tell you. Go, go read a few thousand words, right? Um, <laughs> a guy named Bob Hazen wrote one called Genesis. You can remember that title, right, Janice? Yeah. Anyway, it's all about uh, origins of life research, and it's, it's really good stuff. Uh, it gives an overview of all the different theories and all the experiments that have been done. Uh, he does work in this field himself, and he's got some really cool experiments that show uh, how you could, how he's demonstrated the generation of major components of the metabolic pathways, for instance, just from purely inorganic compounds. So it's, it's pretty hot stuff. Um, if you want to get more theoretical and kind of fun, uh, a guy named Stuart Kaufman wrote a book called Origins of Order. It must be about 15 years ago, but it's still pretty darn good, uh, where, he, where he talks about how you can evolve uh, complex chemical, com chemical arrays. Meta you can evolve a meta met metabolism from simple components. So that's always fun to read. Uh, yeah. You've, you've, you've just asked me for this history of the first two billion years of life, and once in, I just, I'm stuck. You're, oh, it's just Rebecca, though. You don't want to boot me off. Oh, no, it's okay. No, that's fair.